Let's come back now to John the third chapter and um, read again his reply to his disciples when they came complaining about the way in which Christ was was being followed by those who formerly followed John. Um, verse 27 and 28. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. John said he must increase, but I must decrease. It's interesting to notice that John used the illustration of marriage to explain the nature of the situation then existing and to point out that Jesus Christ was not in any sense of the word occupying the position of a usurper but that Christ was doing his work and John was doing his work and there was a success of Jesus' work was a, was a testimony to the success of John's work in other words if men had not flocked after Jesus if they had still remained about John the Baptist then what would his work have been? failure right a miserable failure whereas that which to his disciples seemed like failure was in fact wonderful success and, and a vindication of the fact that John the Baptist had done his work thoroughly and done his work well let's now <coughs> read again from Desire of Ages page 179 where we have now a direct comment on the verse we have just read John represented himself as the friend who acted as a messenger between the both parties preparing the way for the marriage. When the bridegroom had received the bride the mission of the friend was fulfilled. He rejoiced in the happiness of those whose union he had promoted. So John had been called to direct the people to Jesus and it was his joy to witness the success of the Saviour's work. He said, This my joy therefore is fulfilled he must increase, but I must decrease. Looking in, looking in faith to the Redeemer, John had risen to the height of self-abnegation. He sought not to attract men to himself, but to lift their thoughts higher and still higher until they should rest upon the Lamb of God. He himself had been only a voice, a cry in the wilderness. Now with joy he accepted silence and obscurity that the eyes of all might be turned to the light of life. Those statements, of course, um, give to us a very clear evaluation of John's character. He had risen to the height of self-abnegation. Self-abnegation, of course, is humility. It is um, the opposite from pride. But how do men regard self-abnegation as a height or a depth? Right? As a degradation, don't they? Self-abnegation, so they, is not an elevation but it is a degradation now in comments upon this uh, example of John the Baptist we now read in the next paragraph those who are true to their calling as messengers for God will not seek honour for themselves now I appreciate of course the word calling as used in this, in this sentence those who are true to what? to their calling let's, let's turn to uh, Hebrews the second chapter for just a moment the third chapter for just a moment and uh, read again the wonderful example referred to by Paul in respect to the ministry of Jesus Christ Hebrews chapter 3 start with verse 1 Wherefore holy brethren partakers of the heavenly calling consider the apostle and high priest of our profession Christ Jesus who was faithful to him that appointed him as also Moses was faithful in all his house for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he, he that builded the house hath more honour than the house. Now verse 2 says in regard to Jesus Christ, he was faithful to him that appointed him, or faithful to his calling, which means of course the same thing. So just as John the Baptist was faithful to his calling, Christ in turn was faithful to his, and therefore both of these men therefore were holy men in actual fact. Now we today, as we're called individually to be messengers for God, will not seek honour for ourselves, 
love for self will be swallowed up in love for Christ no rivalry will mar the precious cause of the gospel they will recognise that it is their work to proclaim as did John the Baptist behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world John 1 verse 29 they will lift up Jesus and with him humanity will be lifted up thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity whose name is holy I dwell on the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones Isaiah 57 verse 15 the soul of the prophet emptied of self was filled with the light of the divine as he witnessed to the Saviour's glory his words were almost a counterpart of those that Christ himself had spoken in his interview with Nicodemus John said he that cometh from above is above all he that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth he that cometh from heaven is above all for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God for God giveth not the spirit by measure unto him Christ could say I seek not mine own will but the will of the Father which has sent me to him it is declared thou hast loved righteousness and hate iniquity therefore God even thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows the Father giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. So with the, with the followers of Christ, we can, and here's a very wonderful paragraph, one that's well worth um, noticing and remembering. It says, So with the followers of Christ, we can receive heaven's light only as we are willing to be emptied of self. We cannot discern the character of God or accept Christ by faith unless we consent to the bringing of into captivity of every thought to the obedience of Christ. To all who do this, the Holy Spirit is given without measure. In Christ, there is all the fullness of the Godhead bodily in Him, and in Him you are made full. Colossians 2, verse 9 and 10, Revised Version. Now what a powerful paragraph this one is. Let's go over it again because I'm sure that we all would like to be given the Holy Spirit without measure, wouldn't we? Yes. Right. Now here's the secret of how this can be achieved. First of all, we must be emptied of self. And Jesus Christ again is the model of this because we read on page 208 that so utterly was Christ emptied of self that he made no plans for himself. So when we come to that point we make no plans for ourselves but let God be our plan maker, our burden bearer and our problem solvers then this will be the emptying of self and when we do that then of course the way is being opened for the reception of the spirit without measure. And so, so we read the thought again we cannot discern the character of God or accept Christ by faith unless we consent to the bringing into captivity of every thought to the obedience of Christ. To all who do this, the Holy Spirit is given without measure. Now the Philadelphian church, being the church through whom the Lord Christ shall be given, will be a people who receive the Spirit without measure, so obviously, of course, they must be like John the Baptist, a truly selfless people who can say in regard to others, they must increase and I must decrease. Much of the strife in the world today is because men are determined to ensure that they increase while the others decrease. Isn't this right? And if that Spirit was removed from the world entirely, that Spirit of putting ourselves first and, and highest and best, if that spirit was gone and we all loved each other and sought to promote the other's good uh, um, prosperity and so forth, then we have a world filled with peace and quietness and not a world that is forever threatening to burst out into global strife. <clears throat> if we do a little further now, the disciples of John had declared that all men were coming to Christ and with clearer in but with clearer insight John said, No man receiveth his witness. So few were ready to accept him as a saviour from sin, but he that hath received his witness has set his seal to this that God is true. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. No need of disputation as to whether Christ's baptism or John's purified from sin. It is the grace of Christ that gives life to the soul. Apart from Christ, baptism, like any other service, is a worthless form. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. 
Now when the disciples of John said to him, everybody's following Jesus, he said, no, you're mistaken. They're not really following him. And this, of course, proved to be entirely true as time went by. The reason why the people tended to flock after Christ in the early part of his ministry is because they hoped that he would fulfill their proud ambitions and give to them the lost dominion and uh, restore the Jews to national pride and preeminence. In other words, they went after him as gain seekers, as hopers that Christ would do what they thought he ought to do. And when they found later that he come to build a different kind of kingdom altogether, a kingdom based on love and forgiveness, a kingdom filled with, with joy and peace, a kingdom in which everyone served everybody else, then they rejected him and turned aside from him. So that merely joining a church is not necessarily evidence that you have become a true child of God. And the strength of a movement is not measured by is vast numbers but by the quality of the people that make up those numbers that is the evidence of strength in a movement and it's for this reason of course that down to the ages the church the church which has been a church of power the church which has been successful as God's instrument has always been a very small church when do you find where can you find for instance in history the large church with great numbers and huge buildings and all kinds of organizational machinery has been the instruments of God's working. Never. Think, for instance, of Gideon's band, the mere six, 600 men. 300. I'll be 300. Thank you, 300 men. I'm getting confused with David's little army of 600 men. Gideon's 300, that's quite correct. Um, God weeded down the vast numbers of those volunteers until only 300 men were left. 300 men he could trust to do the work that was what they were called upon to do and then there was the lonely David against the mighty Goliath and um, again and again it's been a small band through whom God has done his mighty work because in that small band shaken and purified until the best alone is left God has thought he could really trust and through whom he could do his work and so John perceived, as, as his disciples could not, the real nature of Christ's popularity at that moment. He also recognized that Christ would not be moved by that popularity, that no amount of pressure would induce Jesus Christ to turn aside from his calling to satisfy the pride and ambition of those people. And uh, we could give example after example of that too. I think particularly, of course, of the Lord's Supper when Peter refused to have his feet washed because Peter was confident that... Um, he could summon the backing of the other disciples, of all the friends of Jesus Christ, of all the Jews and all the Pharisees, and that night that Christ stood absolutely alone with his idealism, as Peter called it, and that there was no one with him, which was entirely true. But despite the fact that he was alone, Christ still did not bend in the slightest degree in their direction. He came come to build a certain kind of kingdom under God's personal direction, and nothing would, de would cause him to deviate from the will of his heavenly father. And because he would not deviate, his work was of course a very, very wonderful success. And so John went on to say then in clear terms that um, there was not a question of disputation over which baptism was the more effective, that baptism was but a form and the real value was found in transformed lives made such by the inworking of God's presence and spirit. Now, <clears throat> Jesus, of course, at this point of time, as you read on page 181, recognized that the Jews would make the most of this opportunity and that they would um, seek to, to ferment strife between those disciples of Christ, quietly withdrew and went back in the direction of Galilee. Let's just read this on the second last paragraph on page 181. Jesus knew that they would spare no effort to create a division between his own disciples and those of John. He knew that the storm was gathering, which would sweep away one of the greatest prophets ever given to the world. Wishing to avoid all occasion for misunderstanding or dissension, he quietly ceased his labors and withdrew to Galilee. We also, while loyal to truth, should try to avoid all that may lead to discord and misapprehension. For whenever they arise, or these arise, they result in the loss of souls. Whenever circumstances occur that threaten to cause division, we should follow the example of Jesus and John the Baptist. Both of which men, of course, uh, took exactly the right course of action in um, this case. 
Now across the page, um, well, let's let's um, continue because I really appreciate this thought. I'll continue on page 181 across to 182. John had been called to lead out as a reformer. Because of this, his disciples were in danger of fixing their attention upon him, feeling that the success of the work depended upon his labors and losing sight of the fact that he was only an instrument through which God had wrought. But the work of John was not sufficient to lay the foundation of the Christian church. When he had fulfilled his mission, another work was yet to be done, which his testimony could not accomplish. His disciples did not understand this. When they saw Christ coming in to take the work, they were jealous and dissatisfied. The same danger still exists. God calls a man to do a certain work. And when he has carried it as far as he is qualified to take it, the Lord brings in others to carry it still further. But like John's disciples, many feel that the success of the work depends on, on the first labourer. Attention is fixed upon the human instead of the divine. Jealousy comes in and the work of God is marred. The one thus unduly honoured is tempted to cherish self-confidence. He does not realise his dependence on God. The people are taught to rely on man for guidance and thus they fall into error and are led away from God. The work of, work of God is not to bear the image and superscription of man. From time to time the Lord will bring in different agencies through whom his purpose can best be accomplished. Happy are they who are willing for self to be humbled, saying with John the Baptist, he must increase but I must decrease. Now I would like to stress the principles which are laid down in that paragraph and stress them very strongly and to emphasize the fact that I have been in love with that principle for many, many years. Now, I'll never forget back in 1962, when a group of us down in Wollombar, North New South Wales, Australia, were studying the, um, the principles involved in the work, that we came to the conclusion that um, the Brinsmead family had been called of God to do our work, but, that, but there would be others who would follow them to proclaim, for instance, the separation message and other great truths yet to be proclaimed. And when the when um, Hope Taylor, who was Bob Brinsby's sister and more or less a very strong leader in the whole affair, you never hear much of her, but at the same time she was a very strong leader in the Brinsby cause, she rose up in great indignation and said that God had called Bob Brinsby to carry this work through and he would be there right to the very end and would never be superseded. And we thought to ourselves that that is a very, very serious mistake, which of course it proved to be. Because today the Brinsmeads are far, far away from where they were in those days, don't even keep the Sabbath or believe in the spirit of prophecy or um, the sanctuary service or any of the great Adventist fundamentals. They certainly are not today leaders in that work and have been well and truly superseded. Now, I have long recognised and, 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 and have been fully in love with and totally reconciled to the fact that there will come a point of time when my mission has been completed and when that time comes God will use other leaders in fact I expect the students in these schools around the world to then be the prophets and leaders and then as my work decreases your work will increase and I shall be extremely happy and glad for you all when that time comes and uh, as I said uh, to me the stand taken by John the Baptist is a truly Christian stand it is a revelation of holiness in its best form and no wonder God was glad to resurrect that man and take him to heaven with Jesus Christ when he went back to heaven after his resurrection. No wonder Jesus said that of all that had been born women there was no one greater than John the Baptist and there certainly wasn't and we would all do well to study very carefully John's reactions to the opportunity to become a proud and uh, a proud man dividing away from Christ but he absolutely did not do that he recognised his calling he was faithful to it he was, he was obedient and he was faithful and therefore he was truly an example to us of what holiness actually means and inasmuch as John the Baptist is a type of the last generation of the Philadelphian church we know that we have to emulate the same spirit which was in him and show the same attitudes that he showed so I can't uh, recommend to you the state of John the Baptist's life too strongly, I'm sure. Now, as we read in, on the previous page, Christ now departed from Judea and the Jordan River to journey back to Galilee to continue his ministry up there so there'd be no further opportunity for his disciples and John's to be in controversy over this baptism question. And this, of course, this journey, of course, took him through the land of Samaria. 
which was the province or territory which divided Galilee in the north from Judea down in the south and lay like both the other provinces on the west side of the Jordan River. The Samaritans of course were um, descendants of a mixed race of people. Jews had been left after left by Nebuchadnezzar in the land of Palestine who married um, outside of the Jewish people and were, were of mixed descent. So let's come out of page 183 and read the amazing story of Christ's outreach for this woman of Samaria and how in a very short time he broke through the dreadful wall of prejudice and suspicion and was able to plant the gospel very firmly and uh, powerfully in the city in the city in the land of Samaria. The story is told in John the fourth chapter. Starts with verse one. When therefore Je the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Je Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he, and he, need, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria which is called Sychar, near to the pastoral ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away to the city to buy meat. The word meat, of course, meaning food, not, not necessarily flesh food. Then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Right, let's now pause there before we read the entire story. It goes over quite a lot of verses down to uh, verse 42, which is the full chapter altogether. Um, well, not really, to, yes, to full, verse 42, right, almost the full chapter. So we'll come back to the script, scriptures in just a moment. Let's turn to page 183 now in the um, book Desire of Ages. On the way to Galilee, Jesus passed through Samaria. It was noon when he reached the beautiful vale of Shechem. At the opening of this valley was Jacob's well. Wearied from his, with his journey, he sat down here to rest while his disciples went to buy food. The Jews and the Samaritans were bitter enemies and as far as possible avoided all dealing with each other. To trade with the Samaritans in case of necessity was indeed carried law lawful by the rabbis, but all social intercourse with them was condemned. A Jew would not borrow from a Samaritan or receive a kindness, not even a morsel of bread or a cup of water. The disciples in buying food were acting in harmony with the custom of their nation, and beyond this they did not go. To ask a favour of the Samaritans or in any way to seek to benefit them did not enter into the thought of even Christ's disciples. Now we were discussing in the car coming over this morning certain races of people across the ocean's blue and um, the observation was made, well, I'm quite sure you haven't penetrated into this group yet and we had to admit that we hadn't. Now it's a fact that some races of people are much more difficult to win to the gospel than other races of people. They have prejudices that are very, very deep-seated. They're bound by traditionalism and they find it extremely difficult to have open minds to even consider candidly the evidences, right? While other people, of course, are much more open-minded. And for this reason we find that, for instance, in South Africa, which has been dominated by the Africana people for a long time, who have uh, developed a very strong sense of superiority over the black races, that we, we, we have found that over all these years we have not yet found a single one of those white South Africans who has accepted this message. And so it, it took a long, long time to break through in England too. But in Germany and here in America and Canada we find that folks are much more open-minded and the strongest response to the message is found in these particular countries. Then again we find that the ultra-conservatives which tend to occupy the far northern climes and the emotional folk which, which occupy the more southern climes, for instance in Europe, if you go to Scandinavia you find the ultra-conservative people up there and as you move south, they become less and less logical and more and more emotional until you reach the Mediterranean peoples, the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the Italians, and there you have the more emotional type of person. And we find that across the middle belt, 
where you have a certain amount of emotion and a certain balancing amount of logic, we get the best response for this message. Quite interesting, interesting isn't it? <coughs> and the same is true here also in, uh, in America. I, I would class British Columbia and this end of Canada as being more like the middle belt across America where we, we find the strongest response to the message, but in the southern states down in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana and so forth, where you have the emotional religionists, you don't find much response down there to it at all. And so, going back to the days of Christ, would you class Samaria as being an, being an extremely difficult place to preach the gospel? It was very much so. And there had been built up what seemed to be an impenetrable wall between the Jew and the Samaritan, an impenetrable wall. And um, the disciples of Jesus Christ, of course, I'm certain that when they departed from Judea and began their journey north, they, said, they must have said to themselves, well, down here in Judea amongst the Jews, right, we'd expect a response there, we got a response down there. And up in Galilee, we can ex even expect a better response because they're more um, uh, down to earth and less uh, inhibited by traditionalism up there. But Samaria, forget it. We won't, we'll, we'll get nothing as we go through Samaria. We can rely upon that fact. And yet we find that uh, Jesus Christ takes only a very, very short time to bring a whole city to hear and accept the message of salvation. Christ demonstrated the power of divine love which fills the heart of a human being and flows out in rich streams to a needy person is successful in penetrating where nothing else could possibly penetrate. Now I think that um, we've probably stressed enough the point that um, only, only when we have rich currents of love entering into our lives can we in turn expect to be successful in winning others. References such as Acts the Apostles, page 550 and 551 have been read. Desire of Ages, page 363. And uh, I'll read one I haven't read this week. It's, it's on page 825 in this book, Desire of Ages, 8 to 5. And it's the first paragraph on top of the page, the second line on the page, as a matter of fact. The power, 825 it is, the power of love was in all Christ's healing and only by partaking of that love through faith can we be instruments for his work. If we neglect, if we neglect to link ourselves in divine connection with Christ, the current of life-giving energy cannot flow in rich streams from us to the people. Now that's why I will take time out to read one sentence only from Acts the Apostles, page 551. That's why our success as uh, workers in God's cause is measured by our capacity to love as Christ loved and to work as he worked. Uh, let's get the exact words now. I think they're pretty exact anyway. Uh, page 551, Acts of the Apostles. In heaven, our fitness as workers is measured by our ability, ability to love as Christ loved and to work as he worked. Right, that's, that's our fitness as workers. And the story of the woman in Samaria is the story of the penetration of love through prejudice, hatred, jealousy, pride, and a, a, a dreadful war of separation which had been erected by both Jew and Samaritan, or, or I'm going to say Gentile, but Jew and, Sam, Jew and Samaritan at this point of time. Now, let's come back to the Desire of Ages again on page 183. As Jesus sat by the well side, he was faint from hunger and thirst. The journey since morning had been long, and now the sun of noontide beat upon him. His thirst was increased by the thought of the cool, refreshing water so near, yet inaccessible to him, for he had no rope nor water jar, and the well was deep. The lot of humanity was his, and he waited for someone to come to draw. Now, was the midday hour a likely time to expect someone to come and draw water? It was most unlikely. In fact, I think the reason for this woman's coming at this time is because she was a woman with a bad reputation. She had several husbands and was now living with a man who was not her husband and that was looked upon with great disfavour by the populace of the city. She was a, 
a black mark against the clean reputation of their town. And because of this, she was ostracized by the women of the place and therefore chose to draw her water at a time when the others didn't. The usual water drawing times, of course, were in the cool of the morning or the late afternoon when um, it wasn't so toilsome a task to trudge up the hot path to the well or b and back again with the heavy water pot on one's shoulder. And so the friendly chatter of, of neighborly vo neighborhood voices would be heard in the morning and the evening and she came alone because of the attitude the rest had toward her at a time when no one else was then, this was the midday hour. And so Christ then, from the ordinary point of view, didn't have much prospect of drinking water that day. But God who had planned this whole encounter, remember that, that every day God made plans for Jesus Christ and Christ accepted those plans which God had made for him, that God had planned this entire encounter, knew this woman's state of being, knew her need, knew when she came, and he brought his divine messenger, his son, to the well at the right point of time, so he was at the right place at the right time to do the very work that God designed he should do. And more than that, of course, he was also equipped to do that work because he was filled with God's divine love and power. And so we now read a little further. A woman of Samaria approached and seeming unconscious of his presence filled her pitcher with water. As she turned to go away, Jesus asked her for a drink. Such a favour no Oriental would withhold. In the East, water was called the gift of God. To offer a drink to the thirsty traveller was held to be a duty so sacred that the Arabs of the desert would go out of their way to, in order to perform it. The hatred of, between Jews and Samaritans prevented the woman from offering a kindness to Jesus, but the Saviour was seeking to find the key to this heart and with the tact born of divine love he asked not offer the favour. The offer of a kindness might have been rejected, but trust awakens trust. The king of, the, of heaven came to this outcast soul, asking a service at her hands. He who made the ocean, who controls the waters of the great deep, who opened the springs and channels of the earth, rest, rested from his weariness at Jacob's well, and was dependent upon a stranger's kindness for even the gift of a drink of water. Now this approach on Christ's part was very, very tactful, very, very wise, and it was, it was, it was the expression of a very fine technique in missionary endeavour. But we must not overlook the fact that the success of Christ's approach was dependent upon the fact that his request to her was the expression of divine love, and she felt the influence of that love reaching out to her. Now, for instance, if, um, if a man, just an ordinary common worldly man, a Jew, for instance, or an Egyptian, has sat there and said to her, give me a drink, a man without the love of God in her heart, how would she have reacted to his request? Right, well, probably, well, negatively for certain. She'd have probably given, given him a scornful look and tossed the jug on the show and walked up down there and left him there letting him know by her actions she wasn't going to take any advances from a strange man and that as a Jew he had no right in the world to ask her a drink. But when Jesus Christ spoke those words he conveyed to her, or he projected to her the love of God, there was kindness, there was sympathy, there was something in his voice which was different from anything she'd ever heard before. And that point should emphasize to our minds the necessity of our spending, as he did, much time in prayer, obtaining uh, for ourselves that same spirit of love which, which animated him. Because it is only as the outreach of God's love from the human heart touches another person's life, that person is drawn to the Saviour. Remember again the words on page 825, if we neglect to... Uh, to um, link ourselves in divine connection with Jesus Christ, then the rich currents of divine love cannot flow from us to the people. I'll read, now, read it now from the book to make sure I've got the words right. If we neglect to link ourselves in divine connection with Christ, the current of life-giving energy cannot flow in rich streams from us to the people. Now, did a rich stream of life-giving energy flow from Christ to that woman as he expressed those words, please give me a drink? Was she conscious of it? Well, not, not of course, uh, 
she couldn't intelligently recognize all she could consciously recognize was the fact that here was a winning a winning power that that uh, that uh, she in, that she could respond to that she enjoyed and uh, which was generated in her curiosity instead of running away or giving him a scornful look she said well she said what what is this she said how come that you a Jew ask a drink of me from a Samaritan this this thing isn't done and yet there's something about you that uh, excites my interest and uh, and causes me to ask this question now once Christ of course had had her ear once the stream of holiness had reached out to envelop her and to open her open her mind to become receptive then of course he could then he could say to her as you read on page 184 uh, this is of course direct from the scriptures if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee give me to drink thou wouldst have asked of him and he would have given thee living water you wonder that I should ask of you even so small a favour as a draught of water from the well of, well of our feet had you asked of me I would have given you to drink of the water of everlasting life now, very naturally, of course, the woman at this point didn't understand this very direct and forthright statement because, because Christ was saying to her, now the real facts of these, you don't really appreciate the situation in which you find yourself. Here am I, sitting unrecognized, able to offer you the waters of, of life, that, that stream which will, which will enter into your being and make into a new woman. You don't know it, and, you, and therefore you don't ask me for what I might give to you. Now once again, of course, Christ could never have succeeded in making so bold a statement accepting that in those words there was conveyed a very, very solemn, a, a wonderful solemnity, a wonderful power, and a wonderful graciousness. Let's, let's therefore read a little further now on page 184. The woman had not comprehended the words of Christ, but she felt their solemn import. Note that she did not comprehend them, but she felt their solemn import. In other words, there was a power in the words that Jesus spoke, a solemnity, uh, a love that, that she could feel. And because she felt that, <coughs> the atmosphere surrounding Jesus Christ began to produce a change in her attitude. <coughs> as, we now, as we now read, her light, bantering manner began to change. <coughs> Supposing that Jesus spoke of the world before them, she said, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself? She saw before her only a thirsty traveller, wayworn and dusty, in her mind, she compared him with the, with the honoured patriarch Jacob. She cherished the feeling, which is so natural that no other well could be equal to that provided by the fathers. She was looking backward to the fathers, forward to the Messiah's coming, while the hope of the fathers, the Messiah himself, was beside her, and she knew him not. How many thirsting souls are today close by the living fountain, yet looking far away for the wellsprings of life? Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? that is to bring Christ down from above or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring up Christ again from the dead the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth and in thy heart if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved Romans 10 verses 6 to 9 now Jesus did not immediately answer the question in regard to himself, but with solemn earnestness he said, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water which I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water which I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And when you think about it, these are rather strange words for a simple person to say to, a, to the woman there at the well. Now, if she had known, of course, who it was who was speaking to her, as we today know, then she would have known there was nothing strange about those words. But just try and picture the whole scene. Here's a woman. She'd never met Christ before. As she looks upon him, what does she see? Just a common man. She doesn't, she doesn't see a, a person there with uh, 
angel wings and a radiant light shining forth from him, just a common man, dusty and weary from the travel, and in need of a simple drink of water. And then he starts to make these, these rather profound and amazing statements where he promises her that if she would drink of the water which he would give her, she would never ever thirst again. Now that, that's a pretty grand statement, isn't it, when you think about it. And Christ could never have said those things with conviction, excepting, of course, under the ministration of the Holy Spirit, which ministration was very much there. <clears throat> and as we find that there's growing on her a curiosity and also a sense of need. And Christ had to create in her a sense of need, of course, before he could possibly... Um, offer or really, really bring to her the infilling of the life which he desired her to have. Now, um, she of course kept thinking in terms of material things. She said, as you read it, about two more paragraphs down the very end of the paragraph, she said, Sir, she said, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now, when she received the water of everlasting life, would that prevent her or take away from her the necessity of coming to draw the literal water out of that well day by day. Yeah. No, it wouldn't. She still had to draw that water. So therefore she was confused in her mind as to what that water really was. Now we find too that uh, people at times will confuse the scriptures. Let's turn for instance to John the 6th chapter for a moment to quote an example of how people can misunderstand the scriptures because of their earthly mindedness. Let's, for instance, um, read in verse 50. Now, verse 47, first of all, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Now, what is the tense in this verse? He has it, which is present tense. He says, Truly, truly, I say unto you, He who believes on me has or possesses eternal everlasting life. Does this mean that our bodies will not die? No, it doesn't. Look at verse 54. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, there are some people, of course, who, um, who regard um, this text as being that we already have everlasting life on the physical side as well as the spiritual side. But to which side alone is Christ making reference in these verses? Okay. The spiritual. Otherwise, why should he say, I'll raise him up at the last day? Meaning, of course, he'd raise him up from the dead or from the grave. We don't have everlasting physical life at the moment. We do have everlasting spiritual life if we're truly born-again born, born again Christians. Now, this woman, like those who misinterpret the verse I have just read in John the 6th chapter, did not understand that Christ was speaking in terms of spiritual water and not physical water. And that when she received that spiritual water, she would still have to come and draw water at the well day by day. Now, it was necessary for Christ at this point to bring to her a realization of her spiritual need, and this he did by the next statement which he made, which we'll have to leave, of course, till this afternoon to study as our time has now gone for this study period. And that is, that is where Christ unfolded to her his knowledge by the Spirit of the kind of life which he's led, the kind of life which he didn't want to have exposed but she decided to keep very very much hidden so let's leave it there now until we come back this afternoon as our time has now gone for this study period any questions you'd like to ask or observations you'd like to make okay let's take a closing hymn then